This is a session that I've been really excited about since it was decided that we would have it and that I would be able to conduct it. Um, because these are two people that I think talk about transit and urbanism with some of the most clarity and uh, then they also get right to the point. So we, we've got a lot of history in the new urbanist movement with transit-oriented design and not all of it has always worked out. And in the session description, which I wrote, I actually even asserted that there's sort of a disconnect between what new urbanists do, what people who work on urban design and development uh, who aren't always aware of transit operations and needs do with their designs. And we've seen, we have a lot of this uh, history to look back on in the CNU movement from what we originally called the pedestrian pocket um, to transit-oriented design, which I think we've even evolved beyond. I think GB is even in, responsible for that acronym as well, development-oriented transit. Um, we are, it's, a, it's an evolving practice, but we're going to talk to, hear from and then talk to two of the most informed people and people who, a couple of people who've given this probably more thought than anybody. So, um, let me introduce the two speakers and I'm going to give a brief introduction about their work. Um, and I'll introduce them both at the same time. G.B. Arrington, his official bio reads like this, but I, I want to tell you that he, he also uh, can claim that he invented the term TOD. He's been working on transit-oriented policy, development and policy, and started in Portland. He's the principal practice leader for Parsons Brinkerhoff's placemaking group, and in that role he's responsible for providing strategic direction and leading PB's global transit-oriented development practice. He's internationally recognized as a leader in Todd. Australia's Urban Development Institute recently called GB the world's foremost authority on Todd policy, design, and implementation. His work has taken him across North America to China, Australia, New Zealand, Dubai, and the Caribbean. During his career, GB has directed the preparation of over 150 TOD plans, and in 2011, his plan for transforming Tyson's Corner, Virginia, into America's largest TOD received the Daniel Burnham Award the American Planning Association's most prestigious prize. Before joining PB, GB charted a new award-winning direction for Portland, Oregon's transit agency, TriMet. His innovative planning and community involvement strategies changed the face of transit and land use in the Portland region and received awards from the White House and the Federal Transit Administration. One of GB's proudest accomplishments was creating TOD in Portland and growing it into an acclaimed program. And he's one of the founders of Placemaking and the Revolution Conference. Jarrett Walker is an international consultant in public transit network design and policy. He's been a full-time consultant since 1991 and has led numerous pl major planning projects in North America, Australia, and New Zealand. He currently serves as a principal consultant with MR Cagney in Australia and as a freelance consultant in North America. His new book, Human Transit, How Clearer Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives, was published by Island Press and is available in the bookstore. Jarrett grew up in Portland, Oregon during the era when Portland first made its decision, its decisive commitment to be a city for people rather than for cars, and began his career as an intern with Portland's transit agency, TriMet. He went on to complete a BA at Pomona College and a PhD, gained a PhD in theater arts and humanities at Stanford University. In his diverse career, he's written peer-reviewed articles and publications as varied as the Journal of Transit, Transport Geography and Shakespeare Quarterly. In addition to his consulting, teaching, and speaking, he writes about public transit issues on humantransit.org. So my personal experience with these two um, also comes from my experience with them in Portland. Um, with GB goes back many, a couple of decades actually, when I was a, a junior urban architect and urban designer working with TriMed, and I could see the changes that occurred because of his leadership there. From one that was tra very focused on transit operations uh, at the exclusion of almost everything else to one that was much more focused on land use and urban design. And I do think that both of them, we're lucky to have both of them in Portland, even though they work internationally. So I want to talk about a couple of things I've been reading to get ready for this session. Um, again, I've been looking at the Charter for the New Urbanism. And we have this book, this is my copy, 
of um, the charter. This is a now 10-year-old document um, besides the charter of the new urbanism, which is a single-page document that you can download on CNU's website. We have CNU published this book and uh, commissioned essays by a number of people. And one of the best essays in it is GB's essay on transit. And the, the way this document is laid out is very interesting. While it is an explanation of each of the charter principles, it's a take on these different topics from the point of view of different people in different areas of practice. And and then Jared, Jared has just written this book. And as I mentioned, it's available at the bookstore. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of what I think are some essential excerpts from it that still are very meaningful, even though this book is, the charter book is 10 years old. And by the way, it's being republished. And I believe that GB is writing the, rewriting the essay. GB says in the Charter of the New Urbanism essay manual, the new urbanism is not anti-car. It's about civilizing our transit systems. It's about rewarding the typical trip, which is a short trip, by offering choices for getting around. Streets need to be designed to respect and reinforce communities. We need fewer big highways isolating and surrounding our communities and more small roads to provide an interconnected pattern of streets and sidewalks within our communities. We dedicate more funding to big roads because they seem to carry the most traffic. In fact, our network of small roads, if you add up all the traffic, carries more cars than the big interstates. Short trips make up the most travel each day. If we paid attention to where people want to go and less about what is easy to count, we would shift our attention and our transportation resources to the short trip. And Jarrett, in his book, in some of the opening chapters, he talks about transit as an urban mobility tool and explains that he's written this book to f help us find our way to more rational forms of urban mobility and learn to advocate clear opinions about what kind of transit you want and how that can help you create the kind of city you want. And I really admire Jarrett's book because he goes into some detail to make sure he's using language that's precise and consistent and that you know what words he, he's using and why. And it's really helpful. Uh, I think it kind of goes into, and it might be a good companion to the lexicon for the new urbanism for transit because it could help us all begin to use the same language when we're talking about transit. He also talks about how we tend to make decisions about transit, especially in um, those of us who are designers, about the way that it looks and what we perceive it might do for the urban environment. And we too often settle on a mode too quickly, whereas we might think if we understood more about the operations and the decisions that transit agencies have to make, we might make better urban decisions and then the mode would come as a secondary decision or possibly even further down the line. So he explains the speed of service gets more attention than how frequently it runs, even though frequency which determines the waiting time often matters more than speed in determining how long your trip will take. And I think this is, for people who use transit all the time, this might still be kind of a profound statement. I don't know if, for me it was, I don't count my trip as including the time it takes that I wait at the station. But that's how a transit user does think about it. Whereas if we think about transit from a motorist's bias, uh, we tend to think that speed and the length of the trip is the most important thing. So you, um, I think part of his, the, the value of his book is a way it forces us to think about transit uh, and set aside our biases that very often come from being automobile drivers primarily. He talks about how motorists you know, often give too little weight to that, to frequency, and that that's just another example of how people try to think about transit as if it were something else. And back to GB, uh, maximizing choice and mobility in our communities starts with the pedestrian because every trip begins and ends with walking. Now I wanted to uh, give you a little update on what the CNU's Project for Transportation Reform is doing, which I'm the chair of, co-chair with Norman Garrick, uh, because I wanted to point out that the book that's in the middle, the little blue book, The Sustainable Street Network Principles, lines up quite nicely with a lot of what Jarrett, and G Jarrett says today and GB said 10 years ago. And I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, it's a, intended to be a companion to our ITE manual, and 
uh, but kind of a contrast in that it has pictures and very few words instead of lots and lots of words and very few pictures. But it goes through um, several principles and several key characteristics, and there are a couple in particular I want to point out. This one, which was that maximize transportation, it's principle number three, maximize transportation choice. And in it, we talk about how all people should be able to travel within their community in a safe, dignified, and efficient manner. The graphics here are intended to um, depict a place where all these transit modes come together, transportation modes come together, and people can connect to them easily. And uh, this is the transit served world that I think new urbanists we are hoping for. And then there was a placeholder principle, principle number seven at the very end, um, that is a placeholder for the next version of this document was going to be concentrated on transit network principles. This one we called create harmony with other transportation networks and in it we, we attempt to say that it's the responsibility of the urban design and the uh, street network in particular to leave a place for transit to serve but to make sure that it still creates a place. And I think that this is where new urbanists have a lot to talk to transit operators about. Obviously, we have a lot to learn from transit operators agencies and their concerns, but they have a lot to learn about how uh, they can create better places with their transit. So hopefully, um, this is the beginning of a lot more conversation about this topic and hopefully a new, um, a new chapter in the charter and a new book, and a new book. <laughs> So GB's going to go first, and I'll let you set up here. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Marcy knows that this has been a, um, a pet peeve of mine try to have this conversation with CNU. Um, sometimes I wonder if um, for some of the luminaries at CNU and some of the uh, designers at CNU, whether talking about transit is actually a foreign language. Um, but um, you can you can make that determination. Um, my goal is not to speak very long and to provoke you a little bit, and then Jared may do some more of that, and then um, we can have a conversation because this this is about short presentations and long conversations. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about five principles, maybe to think about. You know, I was trying to think about well, if I was to tell people what they need to learn. Um, let's make it a short list and new urbanism is all about you know numbers and because we learned if I tell you that it's five things you'll know you're supposed to write five things down and if I just kind of blather on you might not write things down so the, the first thing is that you know transit today isn't about what transit used to be about um, and what transit used to be about the kind of the old school our father's transit was about the work trip and that's about 18 to 22 percent of total trips um, it's about providing relief to congestion and another way to say that it's about um, saying that transit is only relevant during the peak hour and the rest of the time we intend you to drive and that we have an automobile oriented world and transit is just a brief intervention um, the new school says that uh, transit is about all trips for all purposes and it's about community building and happily the United States Congress um, agrees with that and so the rules for getting funding for new transit projects if we could get beyond all that gridlock in Washington uh, actually give you the highest score if you link land use and economic development as the single highest measure in determining uh, the justification for federal funding um, and uh, those funds are, are highly competitive um, and so that's really important the other thing that it does is it gets new sponsors to the table cities developers environmental groups um, Marcy mentioned the Tyson's plan this is a picture of some of the pieces of the Tyson's plan and the interesting thing was is that the advocates for transforming Tyson's understood that the status quo wouldn't work. The only way that they could get more density and more value for their land was to develop it around transit. So 95% of all the office development in transit is, um, I don't know why that did that, is um, 
so is within a five minute walk of, of, of transit. Um, and so that's, um, it's driven by market fundamentals, the plan is, but it's also shaped by transit. The other uh, thing I want to put out on the table, number two, is that distance matters differently between uses. You know, we're real used to the uh, cartoon of the quarter mile and the half mile. Um, we heard yesterday from Dan that part of what we need to do is unlearn what we know. You know, it's some people have said for Columbus to discover America, he had to unlearn that the earth was flat. Um, well, I think we have to unlearn that a quarter mile or a half mile matters because it matters differently in different places. So this is a survey from the Washington Metro, and it's for 13 stations from in very urban part of the transect to suburban for office. And what it tells me is the first 600 feet really matter, uh, that mode share drops by 1% for office every 100 feet away from the station. Um, and if you compare the two orange boxes, right at the station, uh, WMATA captures 35% of office trips. A half mile away, it's 10%. But a half mile away for residential, it's 31%. So if we're thinking about the kind of that spatial distribution of what to put in your transit-oriented development, putting uh, retail and office um, is really important. Um, the other uh, piece about that is that those rules of thumb only work um, in cartoons um, because in reality we have different ways and this is this is uh, measuring walking at the, the uh, Century City uh, subway uh, uh, station that's uh, uh, moving uh, towards final design in Los Angeles and you know, you really can't get to all the places because of the road or the golf course or uh, just the disconnected network there. Um, and uh, so if we think about that distance thing, uh, between a quarter mile and a half mile, the number of people walking to transit drops by 50%. I mean, there's still a lot of people, but there's a lot less people. And as a rule of thumb, a 10% increase in distance gives you a 10% decline in ridership. So distance matters really a lot. We know that from just how we use our, our own feet, uh, but we don't often apply that sometimes when we plan our communities. Uh, the other thing that we want to think about is just the cycle um, and uh, uh, when things happen and uh, uh, how to make those connections and uh, uh, how, to, how to make the connection to the TOD and the transit. And, and what I find is very interesting is that you have one group of people that design the transit, you have another group of people that design maybe the award-winning TOD next door, but no one owns the responsibility to get one to the other. You know, in the cartoon, there's always an arrow that, you know, TOD, transit, but there's no organizational responsibility for the arrow. And so if we're, if we're, if we're going to be good designers on whatever side of that uh, equation you're on, we need to do a better job of those connections and thinking about the pedestrian scale in terms of how we do that. Um, back to cycles. Um, you know, the, for a transit project, to move from being a cocoon into a butterfly, uh, if it's a rail project, takes about 10 years, if you're lucky. Otherwise, it takes longer than that. And that's a lot more than one market cycle. It's probably longer than one planning commission or one mayor. Um, and so we need to understand what to do when so that we can deal with all that uncertainty. So in transit speak, there's a thing called Alternatives analysis and preliminary engineering, those are two different phases, and that's the right time to think about location stations, thinking about TOD on a corridor level, and starting stationary planning. If you're lucky, you move to the next phase, which is final design and construction, uh, and that's when you can start acquiring land uh, proactively to do transit-oriented development. That's when, you can, when it's the best time to start talking more closely with developers, making sure that you've adopted plans and strategies and zoning. And then you move into the operations phase, which people pay, spend the less attention to. They s tend to pay attention to these things while they're building them and not w after they already have them. But that's when the most stuff should happen. That's where you need the staff and the incentives, priority prioritizing opportunities, doing more detailed uh, master planning, and taking advantage of all those fixed assets that are already there to link transit and communities. So, 
you know, it, it, it's a cycle, um, and uh, we need to think about how that happens and how to mobilize over uh, that, you know, that period of time. The last thing that I would say is that mode is not as important as you think it is. And I think Jared will talk more about this. And um, I would um, argue that the debate about mode is a distraction. Uh, we need to worry about outcomes, uh, that the corridor defines the mode. In other words, if there are enough people there, it will turn into a rail line. If they're not, it will turn into something else. And we shouldn't worry about what mode it turns into. We ought to worry about the performance. Um, and uh, then once we have the mode, we need to understand that there are differences in a plan accordingly. Um, yes, you can do transit-oriented development with bus or bus rapid transit, uh, but you can't do it the same way that you would do with light rail, and you do it certainly differently than you would do with streetcar. That's not to say that one is better than the other. They're just different. Um, they affect land use in a different way. Uh, they affect walking in a different way. They affect the development community in a different way. And so uh, we just we need to understand uh, that you know, transit isn't one thing, it's many things, um, and just being next to it um, isn't enough. We need to um, embrace it, understand it, and integrate it into our urbanism. So I'm going to stop there, and I'll get Jared's slides up. Thank you so much, uh, GB, for a great presentation, which feeds pretty directly into mine. I'm going to come from a slightly different perspective, and I'm going to almost the same place, but we'll, um, we'll end up with a slightly different angle on it. Um, because I'm, my experience is as a transit planner, and part of the life of a transit planner is often struggling with architects and developers, um, I, um, I feel the need always when I come to the CNU to do a little bit of fire and brimstone, and I will do that. But don't worry, it all has a happy ending. Um, when we talk, when we're doing a development, when you're designing a development, you've got all these renderings happening. And um, you, you, you gotta, you'll got always notice that when you're looking at those beautiful renderings and all those little pastel people, they're doing exactly what you want them to do, right? They're expressions of your own vision about how people will use this development. And yet the people who will actually move into the, your development are citizens of a free society who value freedom and who value the ability to make their own rather idiosyncratic choices about how to live, and that means rather idiosyncratic choices about where to go. And this is the caution that has to be set next to GB's absolutely accurate point that by and large, we, uh, in, in very large terms, we have been focusing too much on the long trip and not enough on the short one. This is the caution that has to be attached to that because the brilliance of living in a city like Portland, where I live now, is not just that I have lots of wonderful things within walking distance or within a couple of miles, but also, remember, Portland is a weird city. It's part of its marketing. And that means there are lots of very idiosyncratic things all over the city that I, in particular, might be interested in. And that means my ability to get out into the entire city is actually pretty crucial to my ability to, 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 be, to feel like a citizen. So I want us to think about the question, do you want the people in your development to feel free? And let's see what it would mean if we actually wanted that. Well, in, when we're talking about transit as an instrument of freedom, when we translate the concept of freedom into the space of transportation, I contend that what we're really thinking about is spontaneity. This is why the car is so fantastic, and this is also why pedestrian life is so fantastic in, a, in its small area. The idea that you, have a le that, that, that you have a system that allows you to travel on a whim, to make unplanned stops, fundamentally to wander. That's not all, what all of our transportation is, of course, but it's the hardest challenge for transportation, and, the, and it is the thing that the, that the car usually prospers on, so it is, I contend, a, th it is, I contend, a thing we ought to focus on a bit. The, um, what that means if we translate in the language of transit is three things. It means frequency. Frequency means you can go right now. That's pretty fundamental. 
And yes, motorists often don't grasp this because they don't have the same problem. In fact, when I'm trying to explain frequency to a motorist, I often have to say, imagine that there's a gate at the end of your driveway that only opens every 30 minutes. You have to have an extensive network and you have to, uh, so that you can go wherever you want and you have to have a legible network so that you can keep much of it in your head, at least as well as you can keep this, the main street network of your city in your head. Well, what if we could see that freedom? I suspect that much of the reason why we spend so much today on symbols of transit access rather than actual transit access is that we don't have a good way to visualize transit access or understand how a particular project might change our personal lives in terms of our freedom to, in, to access the riches of our city. So, and I think that this particular map, which is langu languishing in beta at walkscore.com, but which someone is eventually going to develop, is going to be a, something of a breakthrough product. Because this is a simple map, it's a simple idea. You, simply, um, you can simply plop down your dot at a location of interest, and it will show you isochrones of where you can go on transit plus walking and how fast. So the blobs on this map say that at 9 a.m., that's the area you can get to in 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Now, and so you can, you can, one of the things you can do with this, obviously, is compare the impact of locating in different places. And this becomes a gateway to a much more distributed approach to helping people take personal responsibility for their choices about where to locate, which is one of the absolute fundamentals of getting anywhere with sustainable transportation. So um, you can explore, for example, well, what if, I, what if I didn't locate my office in downtown Portland but went for slightly cheaper real estate out in the Hollywood district, which is still in the east side grid, so it has pretty good access. How would that change who can get to me easily? Or what if I just decided to, I wanted to have my office out in a leafy suburb, maybe near the house? Uh, well, how would that affect? my ability to access the city or people in the city to access me. And it enables people to take personal responsibility for their location choice. And once this is out there as a tool readily accessible on the internet, it will no longer be government haranguing you about the consequences of having located where you did. You will be able to see the consequences very clearly and own the results of that yourself. But I think this map is a little more subversive than that because what if transit's task were really to grow our freedom? Then it would be to grow these blobs for the greatest number of people, expand people's ability to have the riches of their city readily at hand without having to own a car. Obviously, we're not talking just about the area, but the amount of stuff in them. But the reason I find this map compelling is that each individual person can look at this map and, and discern what the impacts are for them based on the places they go, what they care about of a particular transit proposal, or for that matter, of the existing network. Now, the one thing this map does, you'll notice, is it encourages people to value abundant transit rather than necessarily just attractive or fun transit. This map does not care about the mode by which you travel. It may, you may very well really, really love streetcars or really love light rail or really love gondolas or really like to ride on blue upholstery or whatever it is that you like. But the presumption of this map is that even more than you like that, you would like to get where you're going soon. That even more than you like that, you'd like to be able to access large parts of your city, especially the parts that matter to you quickly. It's a pretty radical idea, actually, in some circles. Because if you want your residents to feel free on transit, that means you want abundant transit. We need to care not just about the fact that we've created one wonderful little line next to a bunch of developments. We need to care about how this plugs into an entire network that gets people to anywhere they're going. And if you want abundant transit, that means you want efficient and cost-effective transit. And here is where this becomes really challenging. Because the simple mathematical fact is that we will always have fixed budgets of some kind. And under any fixed budget whatsoever, efficiency is the same thing as abundance. It is mathematically the same concept. The more efficiently we provide something, the more of it we can provide. So if you value freedom, understanding that that needs to be achieved through sheer abundance of service, then you value, first of all, a complete network. Complete network being understood as a network going everywhere, not just a few special lines. 
That means you value all the dimensions of abundance. The other dimensions of abundance in transit are frequency and span. Frequency, how frequently it comes, span, how soon it comes, or how late it runs. Now you, and then all, because this abundance is, is the same thing as efficiency, because it is made possible by efficient network design, you therefore value efficient network design, and that means you also value efficient technology choice. And what I mean by efficient technology choice is technology is chosen because they are an efficient way to provide a certain link in the network. I think it's very hard to argue that the Portland streetcar was designed for that purpose. It's very easy to argue that the Portland aerial tram was designed for that purpose because the Portland aerial tram does something that no other technology could do, namely go over a bunch of things without having an impact on the ground. So here's the challenge for everyone who loves a particular transit technology. And I say this as somebody who loves a lot of tra transit technologies too, has a lot of fun riding them, chooses to ride them as a tourist, but still values where I, getting where I'm going even more than I love those technologies. If you denigrate another transit technology in order to promote your own transit te favorite transit technology, you are denigrating the whole concept of a network. Because the foundational principle of a network is that many different technologies are working in harmony so that everyone can travel freely. If, for example, you are, you are doing anything to promulgate the idea that that particular technology is associated with a particular social class or a particular degree of dependence or anything like that, you're defeating the whole idea of there being a network that, that works together to get everyone where they're going. So here's a challenge. Can you promote your favorite technology without encouraging neglect of other technologies? In some cases, I think that's very hard, but it's something we have to think about. So when valuing great design, we mustn't sacrifice abundance. Now, uh, last year I, I was in Heidelberg, Germany for the first time. Arri you know, you, the only experience of arriving in a city for the first time, you arrive at the railroad station, don't really know your way around, but there was a very clear map, as there always is in Germany, that laid out all the, all the lines of the network, and I figured out that I wanted number 32. And so I sat at a tram stop where it said number 32 would stop, and I, uh, so I assumed that the number 32 would be a tram. And what arrived was a bus, which drove up onto the tram tracks and stopped and let me on. And I realized I just had the experience of not knowing whether I was waiting for a tram or a bus, which is kind of a short step to not caring, especially in Heidelberg, because this was a really nice bus. This, you know, this has the words Mercedes-Benz on it, and in this case, they really do mean what that brand name means. Um, excellent, uh, excellent windows, excellent upholstery, excellent public information, as you see. But now here's the interesting part. A little ways along my ride on this bus, we stopped at a, at a signal right next to a tram. And I looked across into the tram, and I saw exactly the same upholstery, exactly the same design, exactly the same information displays. What I saw was a transit network that wants the different technologies to be as identical in experience as possible, and wants you not to care about which one you're on. Even in Europe, everyone knows that, sure, people all, with all other things being equal prefer rail. But all other things are not equal. We can afford a lot more abundance with buses than we can afford with rail, typically. And that's, how, that's why these networks actually work. And so the way to draw people into valuing that abundance is not by encouraging them to prefer one technology over the other. It's exactly the opposite, a design strategy that is all about minimizing that difference so that you experience the whole network instead. So what does all this mean for urban design? Um, I, it's my style sometimes to say rather provocative, simplistic slogans. There are a number of them in the book. Um, you can argue about whether they're oversimplifying, but people tend to remember them. And what I generally would say about transit-oriented development, if you're going to use that term, is that the single most important principle, if you follow the line of thought I've, I've argued, is that it needs to be oriented toward really good transit. And if you want the people in your development to feel free, it needs to be oriented toward abundant transit, which means it needs to be oriented toward efficient transit. And if that's the kind of transit orientation you mean, then we have to start with the be on the way principle. The be on the way principle is simply states that an ideal transit line, ideally efficient and therefore ideally abundant, is going to be a straight line that feels, or that feels like a straight line connecting many different points 
while seeming like a reasonably direct path between any two of those points. That latter factor is why just slowing down a, tr a transit line in the middle because you're working on a development there can actually be very destructive to the line. The, what is toxic to transit, by contrast, is any sort of, of deviation or cul-de-sac. Everything that is set back from the transit line far enough that the transit agency has to choose between going past it on the main street and requiring people to walk or deviating into a particular development, thereby um, aggravating and ultimately driving away anyone who might want to ride through that point on the larger line. And a very early vivid example is Laguna West. Now, I, I'm, I'm aware that Peter Calthorpe is not much interested in defending Laguna, Laguna West anymore and that this may sound like beating a dead horse. It just happens to be a really nice example, and I like to use a very old example because people are less emotionally engaged with it. Um, Laguna West, one of the first classic greenfield transit-oriented developments south of Sacramento, had this classic style that, that Calthorpe did much to invent um, of the little gridded town center with office over retail and the highest densities and then densities, of course, falling away as you move outward to provide a large area of single-family development. And if you're not familiar with it, this is what Laguna West looks like today. All of the single-family development is built out, a few of the townhouses, almost none of the town center. Uh, it is functioning as a low-density, single-family neighborhood uh, entirely dependent on cars where all the streets are named for architects. And why this happened? Well, it happened for lots of reasons. But I would contend that one of the reasons that happened is that there was never very good transit to Laguna West. And that the, the reason that there was ver never good tr transit to Lag Laguna West is that it is in a place where good transit is geometrically impossible. And it contains a very, very simple geometry mistake, which is that it is the town center where it was placed cannot possibly be on the way to anywhere. It is on an orbital, that is to say, crosstown corridor, which means I can't run a, a strong radial line out of Sacramento that serves it and serves other places and can go on to serve other places. We have to deviate to the town center, which kills the through market of any line that might go further. And this is fundamentally why transit at Laguna West will continue to be lousy as a result of very rational transit planning citywide. One of the very simple ways to think about this, here's a nice easy way to get a lot of people who don't understand transit to get, start getting around what the problem is. How far does transit have to run to serve a thousand people or ten thousand people? Because if you ask that question, the, you get a lot of important things out of it. That explains why density is important, because we're not driving as far to serve people, right? Because they're close. It explains why walkability to the stop, which GB described, is important. It explains why the complete network, which multiplies the attractiveness of every line in the network by making it possible to go more places, is important. It explains the be on the way principle. It also explains why you need to avoid long, empty gaps between development. It explains why the need to stop creating transit labyrinths, street networks that are just uh, uh, impossible for transit to drive through efficiently. And it explains why you need to avoid T intersections among transit streets. Let me talk just briefly about the T and then I'll wrap up. Um, there's a lot of, we hear a lot in the new urbanism about the beauty of T intersections as opposed to four-way intersections. Um, Three-point intersections, however, if you expect transit to operate on all three of those, those segments, then transit is either going to overlap on one of them, which is efficiently or inefficient, or it's going to have to branch somehow. It almost guarantees inefficiency in the network design. So there's the great example of the San Francisco BART extension, which, um, uh, where they, they built an extension that looks like this. It ends in this triangle. SFO is there and Milbrae, the gateway to point south, is there. And if you were thinking like a motorist or a cyclist or a pedestrian for that matter, this looked fine. There was a direct line from everywhere to everywhere else. But transit can't do that. You can't operate it that way. Transit, if you want to keep all the frequency together, you've got to go to one point and then the other. Or alternatively, you're going to branch the frequency, causing uh, dissipation in service, causing this, uh, reducing the level of freedom being provided. That's an intrinsic feature of T intersections. So if you want transit to work, quit building this kind of, of street network. Even if you're building the most wonderful new urbanist paradise inside that street network, the street network has already defeated the prospect of efficient transit and has therefore defeated the prospect of abundant transit. I want to end with something more positive, which is the notion that one of the places that we have built a lot of that is actually superb in working with the fundamental geometry of transit is the car-based sprawl arterial. Now, 
This, is a, uh, this photograph of, of Sahara Avenue in Las Vegas is one that I love, particularly because of the, of the school zone sign, right? Where the school zone sign, which flashes for two hours in the afternoon and everyone slows down to 25 miles an hour, uh, is basically ridiculing the design of the street. Um, and, um, but, but in this kind of sprawl boulevard generally, I contend that we, in, in thinking about how we retrofit that kind of boulevard, we need to notice that we are in ideal transit geography if we figure out how to work with transit. And I contend, this is a, an argument, a conversation for another time, that actually thinking about what would make an efficient transit line on that arterial is actually the key to cracking that arterial and to, and to defining the right kind of future typology, a typology that can be replicated very quickly, scaled very quickly, in the way that the arterial needs. This is an example of how it might feel. Um, the large, transparent bus. One of the basic things we can do is ask American and Canadian bus manufacturers to start importing European designs. Um, you see much more transparency in European buses. You see much, and as a result, you get much more of a sense that while you're on the bus, you are, all, you are still on the street. You no longer have the sense that you crawl into a box to be transported. Rather, you are still in the street when you're on the bus. And this is the sort of thing with, where, with its own lane as it inevitably needs on a busy boulevard, but, but, but uh, as trans transitioning incrementally up to that, we can start to make transit relevant over very large areas as an instrument of freedom by focusing on abundance as the fundamental goal. So let's go incorporate transit into our principles. The geometry of abundance the nexus with freedom and personal responsibility that comes to personal location, and the new op opportunities that arise from working with transit's geometry and not just against it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go back to this image. I was hoping we could end on this one. Um, and as the uh, moderator, it's my prerogative to ask the first question. Uh, well, so while you're thinking of your questions, I wanted to have you each talk a little bit more about bus rapid transit. Um, I, I know um, Jarrett wrote uh, part in the, one of the last chapters of his book more about the, the vision for this um, arterial. This is a major problem in our sprawl retrofit. Uh, our whole case for sprawl retrofit is how we deal with arterial. And I like what both of you said you in your last chapter and, and GB uh, in one of the last paragraphs of the charter essay about bus, bus or bus rapid transit and the particular design of, of almost every element that's necessary to make it better and more desirable. Can, so can you just talk more about that with each other? Who wants to start? How about GB? Sure. Uh, you know, um it's a great topic because there's so much of it that's about ready to come online. Um, I'm not sure it's coming online for all the reasons that we want, but uh, in the new, in the small starts funding from the federal government, in the last two bunches of projects that got approved, there were 25 projects approved across the United States of all modes. 23 of those were bus rapid transit. One was an extension of a light rail line. One was an extension of a commuter rail line. So the previous administration, and to a certain extent this administration, have pushed bus rapid transit because it isn't rail and because it's more cost effective. Most of those places wanted rail. That doesn't mean that they were right, but they had rail envy. Um, and um, you know they didn't maybe apply Jared's principles. So in terms of thinking about bus rapid transit and urbanism, um, my sense is that it may be a little bit like light rail in the 1980s. In the 1980s, we knew that light rail was new, and we hoped that it would shape development. Uh, but we only knew that heavy rail and historic you know, intact rail systems would shape development. And then we learned that we could be successful with light rail. 
I think we're in the same place with bus rapid transit. Um, even the international examples, you know, the development response has been so-so. I've worked on them in, you know, in China and in Australia and, you know, and, and, um, and in Canada as, as well as the United States. So um, I think the jury's out. Um, I think the fundamentals of good development still apply. Um, but, you know, ULI a number of years ago, this will be my last comment, Jared, so you can get ready to jump in, um, made the comment that the transit industry has a bus problem. And uh, the bus problem was is the development community has a bias about buses. Um, and so they're less likely to want to build next to it. And what I would say, like Jared said with the tram and bus example, the the same people are on both, but the, but the development community tends to view bus riders as a nuisance, and they tend to view rail riders as opportunity, even though they're the same people. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, GB has that right on. I agree completely. One of the other cautions I would raise, I mean, an interesting prediction about the idea that BRT is now where LRT was um, 30 years ago. But in addition, um, I would notice that that tool that I described to you has the effect of making the access outcome more visible and tends to have the effect of letting an individual who's assessing their actual access outcomes um, care less about the vehicle. Much of why we care about the vehicle is symbolic. And one of the things that the uh, attractive vehicle is symbolic of is a degree of mobility and access, and we re rely on the symbol because we haven't been shown what the actual out access outcomes are, I contend. Uh, and that that's part of, not all of, but part of why there's so much attraction. You know, there's, there's, you know, there is, for example, this very interesting notion that we hear in the rhetoric that rail implies a permanent service, whereas a bus service could always change. And I can quite very definitely assure you that the Hawthorne Boulevard bus in Portland is not going to be changing. And the reason it's not going to be changing is that it's a fantastic market. And if you really want to know that your service is permanent, locate in between a whole lot of other big transit destinations in such a way that you're on a really successful transit line, and it will be permanent no matter what. On the other hand, the whole story that we were also told about the streetcar as a martyred technology reminds us that, in fact, when the market disappears, the, the, the rails in the street don't save the service. So these are, this is, there's, there's a lot of that to be worked through, but I think one of the key things that will change is the, idea to, the ability to actually visualize and understand your own access outcomes and see in your own personal situation how unrelated they are, really, to the bus rail distinction. So, so just one more point. And, um, part of what transit-oriented development is. First of all, it's not a development product, it's a policy, okay? It's lots of development products. The policy works with rail because of that developer interest. I don't think the policy works yet with bus rapid transit, but urbanism and mixed use and redevelopment works with bus rapid transit. So if you're trying to do development around really good bus service, just make it urban development. Don't try to market it as transit oriented because you're going to get no benefit by calling it that because of the bias. The benefit will come that I have all those choices, that freedom that Jared talked about, and I'm doing development in a, in a place that already has good market fundamentals. So it's interesting. I think I'm hearing you say that uh, TOD has been almost branded as synonymous with light rail and a lot of development and with development as well. It's been kind of branded with the idea of that it's a development that's oriented to transit and that light rail is necessary or fixed rail is necessary and there's a lot of bias that development can't occur unless there is that fixed rail there. We hear a lot that um, you won't see the same kind of development commitment around a bus, for instance. So it's interesting, I think, if I conclude something important from what you're saying, it, we might want to begin to unbundle development and urbanism from each other within the TOD concept here at CNU. Yeah, it's just, just remember it's a, it's a policy. 
As, and, when, and when we start talking about the right kind of development products in the right place, you still can get really good outcomes. I think if I could just add, I think what, uh, the, what I understand what, GI, G, uh, what GB is saying is he's sort of distinguishing between transit-oriented development capital, with ev like every word capitalized, like an official thing, TOD, and just development that works with transit. <laughs> Which could also be called transit oriented, right? I mean, that's what the words mean. Well, what about but, urbanism but there is a that particular, works with transit? Right, exactly. There is a particular brand that, that has a particular set of symbology, and I think that's what GB is referring to. It, it is nevertheless true that we can do great urbanism that is very much cognizant of and taking advantage of the availability of transit mobility regardless of the technology. I think that's where we're going. I think what we want to say is development that works with transit is urbanism. Right. So, mm -hmm. so a great Portland example on the Line 15 that I transfer, by the way, every day to because it's faster than just taking, I take the first bus that gets there and then transfer with that freedom, is the, 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 the Belmont Dairy. You know, it's a wonderful urban infill project that is on a bus line that runs every seven minutes. It's not marketed as a TOD, but it is marketed as great urbanism. But it behaves like a bus-oriented, you know, urbanist product. Eric has a question. An observation, I'm not probably going to muddy the waters up with this and make everything real complicated and confusing, but I want to ask you anyway, because it's something that's kind of, when I see the development come here, it's been bothering me. And it's the issue of scale. Okay, so you see, right now, the development market's picking up, and everybody wants to put in the luxury realm. And it's not, let's put in a few luxury rentals that fits into a nice urban scale. It's, let's put in a super block of 300 units. And we'll put the gratuitous coffee shop because it looks good in the rendering. And you see the people sitting around the cafe that will never get built, that will be vacant. I mean, what, how do we deal with this scale? You permit that, but this, it ultimately deadens the block. And when you do put these things in, you're going to get exactly one type of user. They'll typically be people in their 20s that are going back to the work trip. How do we address this issue at scale? Because it meets the tenets of urbanism. Technically, it means the tenets of transit-oriented development. Technically, yet it absolutely fails when you see it on the ground, and we're left with a big deadening space that we're going to have to wait 20, 30 years to bulldoze and get the scale down. And it's the problem of this massive infusion of money mm -hmm. coming into development that sort of wants to do things at a scale that's contrary to what we see works. I mean, that what you depict here, anything will work because there's so much diversity. I mean, there's not all the users loading on at 8.30 in the morning and getting off at 5. It spreads out throughout the day. How do we get the scale issue? Because I think that that makes transit efficient. That's right. Because you've got people using it throughout the day rather than just at localized time periods. How do we address the scale issue? And it's, it's a development question that I don't, I don't know that I have the answer to. But I think it's really the key piece. Well, you know, in, in our planning, we like to remind people that the capital TOD um, is not a parcel, it's a district. And when I talked about distance, I talked about 600 feet. And actually, you know, 600 feet isn't very small, but if you look at the district of 600 feet, that's 25 acres. And so you start looking at the holding capacity of 25 acres. And so when, when I work with clients, it's about changing that 25 acres. Um, you know, very few times do you have the opportunity to work at the scale of 125 acres, which is the quarter mile. Um, and so, you know, if we start to think of that larger scale, one project doesn't matter as much because we can have other interventions that undeaden that dead project uh, because, they're, because we're working in multiple market cycles. And, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, just being smart about the urbanism so that the buildings do meet the street in the right way. And that's, that's part of the um, failure of lots of transit agencies in solving for development on, on their parcels. You know, they solve for development as a way to raise revenue. You know, watch out what you wish for. You got a lot of money and you created a terrible place. Let me, let me just um, agree completely with everything GB has said, and, and let me just throw out a very interesting technical example that's actually surprisingly relevant to this. Um, it so happens that in North America, um, the spacing of bus stops is unusually close by global standards. We generally have stops about half as far apart as you will typically find in Europe or Australia. The, the, the maximum here is about 200 meters. The average in both, of the, in both of those places is about 400 meters. This is nothing but a cultural habit. 
It has no objective justification. To some extent, it reflects a history in America of having viewed bus service as a social service. So it's much more important that the senior citizen doesn't have to walk than that the bus actually gets anywhere with any particular speed or reliability. But if you thought about the idea of pulling out every other bus stop, you start now to have a rhythm along the street of bus stops that justifies a little bit of a difference in how the development relates to the bus stop. The worst thing you could do is not just build that whack of 300 condos, but to build four of them on four consecutive blocks, and then we'd have a bus stop in the middle of them, and yeah, the cafe's never been built, so there's really no activity around the bus stop, and it all starts deteriorating. Whereas the idea of, of, of fighting for that wider stop spacing, not which has fantastic outcomes for transit in terms of efficiency and abundance, actually has an interesting value in solving the problem you're describing. Well, I, I think there's a there's the temporal issue to that till we get to the next development cycle when they're financing something else, and so then then we get more diversity as opposed to sameness. But the other thing that 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 you picked up on when I talked about you know moving from the from the commute trip to all trips for all purposes, you know the real breakthrough in places like Portland is that the way that you get the most efficiency is by having high frequencies in the off peak and high frequencies in the evening and on the weekend. And you get the most riders. Because you don't have to buy another tr bus. You don't have to buy another operator. Um, and uh, you get very, very high transit use and then high reduced auto ownership because now you're serving all trips for all purposes. And so the agencies that focus on trying to solve just the work trip are actually admitting defeat. They're saying, you know, we're, we're marginalized. We only do a little bit in terms of being that freedom equation that Jared's talking about. Right. Yes. Um, I live in the world of 30-minute headways where local bus will be our highest transit technology for a long time. Um, you had said there's some incremental things you can do to build to that picture. What are some of those examples? Um, <clears throat> It depends a lot on what your transit agency thinks it's for, and that's really a conversation you have to have in the city. If your transit agency is fundament fundamentally, uh, uh, and first of all, it's a conversation you have to take away from the transit agency and have in the entire city. First of all, it's not a technical question, it's a values question. Are you interested in sus pursuing sustainability outcomes that require competing with the car, or are you a social service? Um, if you see yourself as a social service that you don't expect anyone with a car would ever ride, then you, you optimize for a totally different set of things. For example, you move stops really close together because you're focused almost entirely on senior citizens, disabled persons, people who are, have a primary disincentive to walking. Um, but if you want that competitive effect, what you start doing, and I've done this in some very small cities. I mean, I, I've, I've done this in cities as small as, as 50,000, even 20,000, is you start looking for the one or two spots in the city where the car has some kind of disadvantage. A part of the city where you have a parking problem. A part of the city where you really want, where the city wants a more urbanist outcome, even if it's just it's downtown. And they understand that they've got too many cars downtown, it's destroying what they want to do, and you start building on that. And they start, th and you start getting to the city to the point where it has the courage to actually start turning down parking or turning up parking pricing and letting the transit agency actually fill, some, fill in some of that. Because people will do the thing that makes sense. And if driving downtown stops making sense, they will do something else. 
um, and, and, and you can make that happen. And so I've been around lots of really pretty small places that have gone through this transition. The other thing you have to do is that if you have a history of designing for social service, your, your network map probably looks like a confusing plate of spaghetti because every time a senior, someone has called up and asked you to deviate the bus down their, their street to serve them, you've done it, and as a result, the, the, the routes are slow and circuitous and confusing. And so you have to have a debate about, about that. You have to do a, a proper restructuring study where you understand the consequences of having done that and can understand the consequences of undoing some of that and making the fundamental mental move, which is to ask people to walk further to a service that's more useful. That's always the formula. So, so, so to put an edge on that, sometimes that means canceling the, the bad service. So you need to move back to Washington, D.C., and they need to cancel your 30-minute route. Because what will happen is, if you can have better service on fewer routes, you'll get a lot more ridership. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, think so there's some really practical, yeah. uh, or some some more uh, tactile things as well. I don't know if that's what you were talk also imagining, but um, the design of the bus and the making passengers of the bus feel, customers of the transit feel like first class customers, not second class. Um, I think the design of buses could use a huge improvement, as has been mentioned a couple of times already. <laughs> uh, um, just but just because you mentioned Tallahassee, I just want to—I just want to um, wave their flag a little bit. They did something incredibly courageous this year, just incredibly courageous in going to, in ripping out their old complicated radial network, and replacing it with a much simpler grid network where many people have to transfer, to do trips that used to be direct trips, but where everything is now more frequent, and tr and as a result, transferring is easy. And I, I have specialized in exactly that kind of redesign for 20 years now. It's one of the main things I do as a consultant. And I am familiar with all of the incredible political agony that goes through that. And the political courage that required was pretty remarkable. I can still remember, I'm sure GBD, GB does too, we're coming up this fall on the 30th anniversary of the East Side Grid in Portland which it was at least as important at light rail as light rail in establishing what Portland is now. The basic idea that instead of having a bunch of routes dribbling out from downtown, we'd have a big clear grid of high frequency services and many people would have to transfer to get downtown and that would be okay. Portland did that in 1982 already as a much bigger city than Tallahassee. So um, Tallahassee is probably the smallest city where I'd recommend this, but I was very impressed that they tried it. Another question? Well, let me ask an, a question of my own then. There's one back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, so I, I, I agree with everything that you said about uh, you know, figuring out who we're serving and, uh, and, and thinking about transit, not necessarily as a service. Having said that, I, I think we, we would also all agree that we want to maximize the freedom of senior citizens Absolutely. and people with disabilities and people with disabilities. Do you want me to take that first? Or just sure. Um, uh, there's a short-term answer and a long-term answer. The short-term answer for, for people who have aged in place where they are and are now have the needs where they have them is some, is some kind of appropriately demand responsive service with reasonable pricing uh, com for those who truly cannot walk. The other thing you do is ignore a certain amount of the complaints about how I cannot walk because many seniors actually will walk to better service just like everyone else does. Um, but And it's a very difficult process when you're interacting with seniors and you've got to have a clear policy in hand and you've got to be able to show very clearly what the benefits are of what you're doing. That's why those kinds of maps are so important. There's a different answer in the long term and that's the principle of helping people take personal responsibility for their choice about where to locate 
and helping people to do that, to start doing that, uh, starting at about age 50, frankly, <laughs> and certainly when they start thinking, start thinking about retirement locations. Not very long ago, the Federal Housing Administration would actually give, actually preferred to fund senior developments that were located in rural locations because the assumption was that senior citizens don't need much of a social life. They mostly want to sit and listen to the birds. And in the real world, of course, senior citizens are as diverse as we are, and they want all kinds of things. <laughs> and there needs, obviously needs to be that diversity. I know there are whole other panels and expertise working on that, but this very difficult issue, which is uh, difficult for a lot of people, of helping people visualize what their lives will be like when they can no longer drive and helping them make decisions about location that, that are going to work with that reality, that's something there needs to be a lot more focus on. And it needs to be there in urban design, it needs to be there in federal housing policy, and it needs to be there in just the way we interact, frankly, with the, with the seniors in our own lives. I'm going through this with my mother right now, helping her think through exactly this. So, um, so that's the other thing. It comes back to the personal responsibility that you take for the consequences of your location. You know, part, part of it's why we're having this conversation at CNU. Um, because it's also about land use, you know, and in the debate about, you know, did the chicken and the egg, what came first? Um, when I was director of strategic planning at TriMet, we decided that land use came first, not transit. Um, and that took us down some interesting paths, which was that we needed to not define success just by ridership and that land use was part of defining success and that one of the ways to measure success in transit was well what are the what the the phrase now that's being used of the trip not taken mm -hmm. and so if if someone is able to walk to that pint of milk or walk to the doctor or combine multiple trips after they got on their transit service or out of their car that we were equally as successful and it wasn't just about, you know, thinking about how many transit trips did we create, but thinking about the communities that we were serving and the act of, of creating communities. And so, uh, you know, part of this is getting transit agencies to think in different ways and to design their service in different ways and design their systems in different ways. Um, and I say a lot at the, at the you know, at, at transit conferences, you know, that Pogo was right, we've met the enemy and he is us, and a big part of the problem is transit because, you know, the transit is not designed in many times to be a good neighbor for the kinds of things that we're talking about at CNU. Why would you want your, uh, you know, your great new urbanist development next to transit when transit is being designed in such a way that's, you know, offensive? So we have to also do a better job of designing the transit too. It's not, it's not a public good if it's badly executed. We probably have time for one more question. Over here. Is it a worthy strategy to talk about putting DRT in a transit corridor as a precursor to the sexier model uh, of streetcar or light rail if the initial cost of implementation is the only barrier? Um, uh, Yes, I, I think it can be, and I think it's not dishonest to do so, even though many of those BRT lines will never turn into light rail. Um, and the reason I think it's not dishonest is that if your goal is actually abundant access, the reason we build light rail is to change the ratio between passengers and drivers. Fundamentally, that's what it does. It makes it possible to, uh, to carry hundreds of people with one driver. And remember, always transit operating costs are mostly labor. So that's the fundamental of, how, of, of why you build light rail if, if, mobility, if uh, and mobility and access are your objective. So it makes perfect sense. In a corridor where you intend a lot of, new, of urbanist development and where you intend the market to grow rapidly, yes, there will be a point when the bus rapid transit is no longer functioning. And there's an interesting example right now in Los Angeles of the Orange Line, which was implemented as bus rapid transit and which is already, frankly, at the point <laughs> where it really should be converted to light rail. It's massively crowded. Um, there the issue becomes the, the federal funding process and the regional priority process have trouble absorbing the idea that this corridor that we already did, <laughs> right, that is done, actually needs to be revisited. That's a very hard thing to get a big regional government to focus on because so much of the regional thinking process is about, okay, you got yours, now you got yours, now you got yours. Mm -hmm. 
But it is, it is technically very logical, I think, and, and uh, very appropriate. But, but then you have to design it with, with change in mind. I mean, the, the orange line costs about $750 million, so it's a little bit harder to dispose of than uh, some other uh, BRT lines. Yes, we're at the end of this session. So let's give our presenters a big hand.